Remember, a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Tonight, from Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark greeting cards bring you Fred McMurray in W.F. Harvey's August Heat on the Hallmark Playhouse. Each week, Hallmark will bring you Hollywood's greatest stars and outstanding stories chosen by one of the world's best-known authors, the distinguished novelist, Mr. James Hilton. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is James Hilton. Tonight on our Hallmark Playhouse, we are justly proud to present a dramatization of W.F. Harvey's extraordinary tale, August Heat. Originally, the locale of the story was in England, but since many of you are more familiar with New York, we have taken the liberty of transferring it there. I wonder how many of you can remember the August heat in New York this year. The hordes of people with only one thought in mind. Somewhere there must be a relief from the terrific heat. And when relief can't be found, this heat can become maddening, and then anything can happen. Our rather unusual story takes place on such a day. And for our star, we are fortunate indeed to have Fred McMurray. And now, before we begin August Heat, here's Frank Goss, who has a few words about Hallmark. Thank you, Mr. Hilton. There are Hallmark cards for every memorable occasion on your calendar. For birthdays, anniversaries, holidays. Yes, for every occasion that calls for remembrance, for a friendly greeting, a word of good cheer, an expression of sympathy. There is a Hallmark card that says just what you want to say, the way you want to say it. And that identifying Hallmark on the back, well, that says you cared enough to send the very best. Now, Hallmark Playhouse, presenting W.F. Harvey's August Heat, starring Fred McMurray. August 20th, 1949, a day to remember. Newspapers with blazing headlines said the temperature was well above 100 degrees. The heat wave was at its height. Walking down the street was like being in a boiling steam bath. It took courage for a man to venture forth. And inside a hotel room occupied by Jim and Mady Withencroft, there was no difference except it was closer and more stifling. Room service, will you have a bellboy send up another pitcher of ice water to room 617? Thank you. Yeah, it's like a hot box in here, Mady. Oh, it's unbearable, Jim. Mady, look out the window here. Look at that man across the street. He's walking so slowly you'd think he was wearing weights instead of shoes. Reminds me of a fly trying to walk on flypaper. Is that what you made me get up for? It's a wonderful idea for a sketch. I could characterize him as a man trapped by the heat. And as he steps forward, the melting pavement would begin to draw him down like quicksand. But you never paint anything like that. Jim. Jim, I'm frightened. Let's go back home. But, Mady, we've just arrived here in New York this morning. There are several art dealers I want to see. That's why we came here. No, no. I have a feeling that if we stay here, something awful is going to happen. Mady, what are you trying to do? Jinx me? I didn't know you were superstitious, Jim. Just why are you all of a sudden? Do you have the same feeling I have? No. No, I don't. Let's not talk about it. You do feel that way. It's written all over your face. Please. Can't we go home now? I... I can't. Why not? What's to hold you? I don't know. I just know I can't leave. Oh, nonsense. I'll start packing and make the train reservations. You won't have to worry about a thing. It's no use, matey. I've got to stay here. Nothing else seems to matter to me right now. Jim. I'll tell you what, darling. Uh, you go on out to your sister Alice's house on Long Island. In the meantime, I'll get to work on a sketch of that heat-riddled gentleman. I don't want to go without you, Jim. Please, matey. It won't take me long, and... Well, maybe getting to work will clear up this strange, uncertain feeling. I'll wait for you. Oh, that's foolish. It's ten o'clock now. I'll meet you at Alice's by two. All right, Jim. Mr. 
Withencroft. Mr. Withencroft. Oh, yes? You all right? Oh, yes. Uh, why? Hey, you're as pale as a ghost. Hey, you want some cold water? Oh, you're the bellhop. You brought the ice water. <laughs> Mr. Wright did that hours ago. Huh? Oh, oh yes. Uh, what time is it? Uh, five o'clock. Five o'clock? Thanks. Hey, this picture you drew. Not bad. Picture? I drew this? This horrible thing? Looks that way. I don't remember doing it. Yet I was sitting at this board when you came into the room. I... I must have done it. Mister? But how? How did I get this idea? You must be interested in crime, no, Mr. Withencroft. No, no. No, this is completely different from any work I've ever done. I do landscapes, pastoral scenes. I sketch the panorama of a city. Yeah, this is different, all right. You drew a man about to leap on somebody, and in back of him is the electric chair. Yes. Look at him. He's fat, enormously fat. And the expression on his face, it's... It's one of horror and absolute collapse. And his body... There seems to be nothing in that man strong enough to hold up that mountain of flesh. Why did I sketch him? Why? That's the heat, mister. Anything can happen in this August heat. He seems so alive. He's practically breathing. Hey, you didn't finish the picture. No? A fat boy has his right hand held high in the air like he was ready to stab somebody. Only there's nothing in his hand to do it with. Yes, that's right. I didn't give him a weapon, did I? Well, why don't you draw in a knife? A knife? No. No, it's not subtle enough. This man is out of the ordinary. He's different. Look at his hands. He works with his hands. A tool that, that he uses in his work would be more the thing. Mr. Withencraft, you came into my art gallery five minutes ago, introduced yourself, and have looked through me ever since. It's just too hot to waste my time. You have a sketch to show me or not? I... I don't know how I got here. I'm confused. My wife's very worried about me, and I was going to take a cab to the Long Island Railroad. Do you have a sketch to show me or not? Oh, uh, yes. Yes, I have it. Here. Ah. It's very interesting. You used a model, of course. No, no. Well, surely you're familiar with the man you drew. I've never seen him in my life. Oh, that's very creative. I'll buy it. You've set a price? Price? Oh, I... I can't sell it. But I'm prepared to pay $200. $200? I need the money very badly. It, it would make me very happy. Uh, then it's I... a deal. An artist should sell his work. I want to sell mine, but, but not this one. I don't know why, but this one should never be sold. Yeah, that's strange. That's very strange. But it's your affair. <clears throat> I'll see you out. No. No, it should never be sold. Tell me, how do I get to the Long Island Railroad? I have to meet my wife. About five blocks east. You can't miss it. Um, thank you, sir. No, no, no. No, no, not that way. Mr. Withencroft, you're going in the wrong direction. Hey, Mac. Hey, Mac, what's the matter with you? I... I'm... I'm, I'm all right, officer. Where are you going? Going? I... I don't know. What time is it? It's past 8 o'clock. Oh, I, I've got to go. Yeah? Mister, you've been walking round and around 135th Street. You just keep circling the block. 134th Street? No. No, it can't be. you got eyes, ain't you? Look up at that sign. 134th Street? Why, I... I walked all the way from 47th Street in all this heat. In all this heat. Why? Why? But go on, I'm listening. I... I wish I knew I... I'm listening. I... I wish I knew I... 
I don't... Why? Go on, I'm listening. I... I wish I knew I... I don't wish I knew I... I don't remember walking here. All I know is that the heat comes up from the pavement like waves. I... I can't think. My... My head aches. Well, that ain't hard to believe. What are you looking for? You know anyone in this neighborhood? No. No, but something, I... I don't know what it is, keeps... I don't know what it is, keeps driving me on and on. I... I tried to turn back, but I couldn't. I couldn't. Ah, uh, the heat's really got your brother. I know it's been a scorcher all day, and it's going to... Not going to ease up tonight, either. Maybe I'd better take you in. No, 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 please, officer. I'm... I'm all right now. I... I, I, I really am. Ah, uh, you look as if you're ready to fall right in your face. I'll, I'll just go in that yard. I'll... I'll rest and then I'll leave. Okay. But get off the street. I'd run you in, only it's too hot to call the wagon. Oh, good. I've got to lie down. Yes, I... I've got to... I've got to... I've got to lie down. Go away. Who did rags? Go on now. Go on. I'm sorry, sir. He won't bother you. I'm Charles Atkinson, proprietor of this monument works. Is there anything I can do for you? Well, if, if you don't mind, I'd like to rest here for a few minutes, and then I'll be on my way. The place seems like an oasis. Well, that's an odd thing to call a tombstone maker's shop. You're not feeling well? I've never been so completely worn out in my life. You live around here? No. No, I'm from Bank... Mr. Atkinson. Yes? You look very familiar. So many people tell me that. They never forget me once they've seen me. My face is my trademark. Oh, no. No, it's impossible. We couldn't have met before. This is my first day in New York. Yet it's amazing. Your, your face is clearly etched in my memory. How interesting. Have you ever been to Bangor, Maine, Mr. Atkinson? I haven't been on a vacation in 25 years. Well, that takes care of that. I guess I... Yeah, quite all right. But I... I just can't get you out of my mind. Why? You must be mistaking me for someone else. You know, most fat men look alike. No. Yes, it's fantastic. It's unbelievable. Millions of people in New York, millions of homes. I don't know how many streets... What are you and trying to say? I've walked for hours, not knowing where I was going or what I was looking for. But now I know. I know. Now look, mister. Mr. Atkinson. Today I sketched a portrait of a man who I'd never met or seen. I pictured him as a murderer. And that man in every physical detail is you. Yes, you. In just a moment, we'll return to the second act of August Heat, starring Fred McMurray. Miss Dolores Cairns of Cambridge, Massachusetts, is one of our contemporary American poets. And in the Phoenix Nest column conducted by William Rose Benet in the Saturday Review of Literature, Miss Cairns wrote of the magic of words. Of all the truths Miss Cairns expressed so beautifully, this seemed particularly memorable. Words are hands that reach through space filled with friendship, strength, and grace. Yes, words do reach through space to strengthen friendships, double joys, deepen love. And those who make Hallmark cards appreciate this magic of words, appreciate it so well, the words in a Hallmark card truly express your own feelings, whatever the occasion. Joyful anniversary congratulations, heartfelt birthday wishes, a warm hello to a friend afar. There's a Hallmark card that says just what you want to say, the way you want to say it. And the same skill that perfects the words in a Hallmark card perfects every detail of design, color, and craftsmanship. So it's easy to choose a Hallmark card that expresses you. And the identifying Hallmark on the back, of course, tells your friends you cared enough to send the very best. Now here is James Hilton with the second act of W.F. Harvey's August Heat. Starring Fred McMurray. Oh, 
August 20th, 1949. It was night, the heat had become intensified, and Jim Withencroft was experiencing the strangest day he had ever known. He had drawn a picture of a man he believed existed only in his imagination, and now this man stood before him, huge and ugly, the sweat pouring from his scalp. This heat. Mr. Atkinson. Mr. Atkinson, how was it possible for me to come to this place and find you? Coincidence, my boy, that's all. I wish I could get myself to agree with you. Why shouldn't you believe me? There's such a thing as mental telepathy. There are people who can read minds from hundreds of miles apart. But we never saw each other before. I told you before, most fat people look alike. It's possible, but I know it isn't so. Mr. Atkinson, I... I'd like to ask you a personal question. I have nothing to hide. Have you... Did you ever commit a crime? Yes. I pay my bills on time. I don't overcharge my customers. I drew a picture of you that was correct. I found you without looking for you. And you can't get it through your head that I'm an honest man. Yes. Well, what can I do about it? Would you like me to commit a murder to satisfy your curiosity? <laughs> Rags. Rags, be still. He certainly obeys you, doesn't he? Why not? I'm his master. I still can't understand how I could sketch you about to lunge at someone. And in the background, the electric chair. That's amusing. Your sketch would make a very interesting souvenir. It's yours, Mr. Atkinson. Maybe if I'd get rid of it, I might be able to breathe again. Of course, I'll, I'll remove the electric chair. Oh, no. Matter of fact, I'd prefer that you finish it. I'd like you to include a weapon in my hand. You mean that? Certainly. I never like to see any work unfinished. Do you have any preference? A knife or... A chisel. A man could commit a clean murder with a chisel. Could you make the fix now? No. No, I'm, I'm too tired. I'll, I'll take it with me and mail it back to you. I'd better get going. You're not leaving. What? I mean, I'd like you to stay. I want to show you some of my handiwork. Well, I'll, I'll be back another time. No. See this marble headstone? Not much good. It's all for the summer weather. Man, it'd be a fool to buy it because when winter sets in, the weak points show in the marble. Then why are you working on it? <laughs> you won't believe me, but it's for an exhibition of headstones. I, I don't like to be rude, but I just have to be going. There's no hurry. Look at the inscription on the stone. The lettering is perfection. Yes, but Mr. Atkinson... Look at it, please. It's beautiful work. Yes. You haven't even looked at it sacred to the memory of, of James Wittencroft, born January 18th, 1910. He passed away very suddenly on August 20th, 1949. That's today. In the midst of life, we are in death. Trembling. Do you know my name, Mr. Atkinson? No. Why? My name is James Withencroft. You needn't be afraid of me. I assure you, I don't mean to harm you. Why did you select the date January 18th, 1910 as my birth date? It didn't make any difference to me. I inscribed it without even giving it a thought. I was born January 18th, 1910. And just this morning, I was telling my wife, Mariah, that there was no such thing as ghosts. Mr. Atkinson, I don't pretend to understand why these coincidences, as you call them, are happening, but but I do know that I'm getting out of here. But quick. You can't. And who's going to stop me? Yourself. You must be out of your mind. I'm going. Or not, you won't. I know you won't. Even a gun couldn't stop me. But something more powerful will. Fate. I'll beat fate. All I have to do is get away from you. Why? I don't want to harm you. What have I got to gain, the Electric chair? How do I know? How do I know? Destiny for some mysterious reason, has entwined our lives. We owe it to each other to await the result. Together. No! Very well. You're free to go. If you can. I can't make you stay. Well, go on. Why don't you leave? Uh, what's the use? I, I can't. Fate has me pushed into a corner. And there is no exit. We don't have long to wait, Withencroft. Until midnight. Mariah. 
Mariah. Mm. You know, Charlie, when I read my poetry, I desire not to be disturbed. Forgive me, my darling. This is a friend of mine, James Withencroft, oh. a very fine artist. You read poetry, Mr. Withencroft. It soothes the soul. No. I'm not interested in poetry. I used to be interested in landscapes and pastoral scenes, but the tragedy of life has caught up with me. I now deal exclusively in violence. Portraits of murder is preferred. Would you like to see my latest creation? Goodness, no. Mariah can't stand any form of violence. She's a pacifist. She only loves beautiful things. And you, Mr. Atkinson? I haven't made up my mind. Do you know, Mrs. Atkinson, my name has been inscribed on marble, but not for posterity. In the winter, the marble will crumble. In the summer, I'm a success, though the marble has a flaw in it. But one must be grateful to at least be able to last out the summer. Look, Withencroft, we're both in the same boat, and there's no need for you to cause Mariah any discomfiture. Why don't I get up and leave? Oh, please, don't go. I couldn't bear anyone leaving my home angry. Would you... Would you care for some cake and hot coffee? No. No, thank you. And you, Charlie? I'll go get mine. No, you don't. You don't leave my side for a moment. I'm a large man. My system requires great amounts of food. You're still not leaving this room. I don't trust you. Very well. I can satisfy my hunger later. Will you just sit here and look at the four walls and wait, Atkinson? Wait for midnight and another day. If there is to be another day. And the weary day turned to his rest. Lingering like an unloved guest. I sighed for thee. I won't have it, Withencroft. You've upset my Mariah. Poetry is very soothing, Mr. Withencroft. Very soothing. You soon forget your moods and your troubles. Won't you try? Time goes more rapidly, Withencroft. Tension is released from your mind. Read. Yes, read. Here's my book. Go on. It's like prayer. Death will not come when thou art dead. Soon... Too soon, sleep will come when thou art fled. Of neither would I ask the boon I ask of thee, beloved night. Swift be thine approaching flight. Come soon. Soon. What time is it, Withencroft? Five minutes past ten. <laughs> Less than two hours to go. Aren't you afraid, Withencroft? No. It's 11 o'clock. I had better water my ferns. You see, they're very delicate. They'll die if they're not watered during this heat. Nothing disturbs you, does it, Atkinson? Why should it? I remember when I was a young boy that staying up until 12 o'clock was the most exciting thing in life. Shut up. Shut up. It is the most exciting thing in life, isn't it, Withencroft? Shut up! This is a remarkable day. The most remarkable day in my life. And while the events are still fresh in my mind, I put them on paper as clearly as possible. Right now, we're sitting in a room at the back of Atkinson's shop. He has sent his wife to bed, and Rags, his dog, is beside him. He himself is busy sharpening some tools at a little oil store. The air seems charged with thunder. I'm writing this at a shaky table before the open window. The leg of the table is cracked, and Atkinson, who seems handy with tools, is going to fix it. As soon as he has finished putting the edge on his chisel. It's almost 12 o'clock. I shall be gone within the next few minutes. But the heat... The heat is unbearable. It's enough to... to make a man go mad.
James Withencroft was found by the police the following day, dead. A manuscript containing his story was found next to his body. Upon investigation, it was discovered that no such person as Charles Atkinson, monument maker, had ever existed. Before James Hilton and Fred McMurray return, I'd like to ask if you've seen them yet. I mean those big and beautiful hallmark bouquets, a delightfully different kind of greeting card. For each of these original cards is a graceful cut-out basket that stands nine inches high. It's topped with a large, crisp taffeta bow and filled with beautiful flowers. Ruby red roses, snowy gardenias, delicate sweet peas. Flowers so vividly reproduced you can almost sense their fragrance. But unlike flowers that fade, a Hallmark bouquet keeps its beauty. Hallmark bouquets cost only 50 cents, and each embodies the unmistakable good taste that distinguishes every Hallmark card. And whatever the occasion, anniversary, birthday, get well wishes, there's a Hallmark bouquet that will give lasting pleasure. For its beauty does not fade, but like your friendship, will stay. Always as bright as it is today. So discover this original and charming way to remember your friends. Stop in at the friendly store where you buy your Hallmark cards and ask to see the beautiful Hallmark bouquets. Here again is James Hilton. Thank you, Fred Murray, for your very believable enactment of tonight's most intriguing story. Rather different from our usual kind, but uh, why not once in a while? Well, it certainly was an exciting one-day experience, Mr. Hilton. And uh, speaking of one-day experiences, uh, August 30th happened to be my birthday. And that day was certainly highlighted by many Hallmark greeting cards which I received from my friends and family. Also, if you remember, that was the day you invited me to appear on tonight's uh, story on Hallmark Playhouse. Well, Fred, I'm glad Hallmark helped you celebrate that happy occasion. And now may I say thanks again for tonight's performance, and I hope you'll come back soon. I'd certainly like to, Mr. Hilton. And incidentally, I'd like to add my thanks to Ed Begley, who played the part of Charles Atkins. Yes, indeed. And now, uh, who's coming for next week's show, Miss Hilton? Next week, Roddy McDowell joins us in the Hallmark Playhouse when we present National Velvet, a stirring adventure story of a world-famous racehorse by Enid Bagnold. Oh, fine. I'll be in a grandstand seat. And the following week, we shall have MacDonald Carey in The Virginian. Our director-producer is Bill Gay. Our music is composed and conducted by Lynn Murray. And our script tonight was adapted by Jack Rubin. Until next Thursday, then, this is James Hilton saying good night. <laughs> Hallmark cards that are sold only in stores that have been carefully selected to give you expert and friendly service. Remember Hallmark cards when you care enough to send the very best. Fred McMurray will soon be seen starring with Claire Trevor in Borderline. This is Frank Goss saying good night to you all until next week at the same time when James Hilton returns to present National Velvet starring Roddy McDowell. And the week following, McDonald Carey in the Virginian. And the week after that, Rose Wilder Lane's Let the Hurricane Roar. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.